Okay, so last week um, we talked about uh, church culture. Um, you know, we're talking about these elements that that every kingdom ever has had, and um, and we kind of started in Acts two. Um, we're, we're actually gonna we're Luke gives us this kind of snapshot of what the early church looked like. And we're actually going to look at another one of those um, today. But one of the primary elements of early church culture was the idea of sharing um, and everything, what we would uh, call communalism, which is very different than communism. A lot of people get communalism and communism kind of mixed up, the, the act of sharing everything. Um, but some people read Acts 2 and 4, and they, they get nervous because they think that the Bible is pushing communism, but there's some major differences. The major one is communalism is voluntary. Um, communism is not. It's one thing to voluntarily share your things. It's another thing to be forced to share. That, that's not really sharing if you're forced to do so. Um, but the early church shared everything. And there was no compulsion to do it. They just did it. Generosity was voluntary. But this reminded me of when some of my older boys um, were little and we were kind of learning about the early church and sharing everything. Uh, and they loved the idea, um, uh, at least within our family. And so they came up with this plan of buying a cul-de-sac. My older boys were going to buy an entire cul-de-sac, and they wanted each of us to live in our own house around the cul-de-sac, which was, which was cute until it got, like, specific. <laughs> because then they were like, and then we could eat dinner together every night. And they were like, well, that'd be great. Well, that means we all have to marry somebody who can cook, right? And so they're, they're having this conversation, and Esther and I were, were, jo- <laughs> were joining in. And so it started as, like... Um, Except I really like Chinese food. Someone was like, then we'll marry an Asian girl. One of us will marry an Asian girl. And so they started going around the table. And Josiah, God love him because he married uh, my daughter-in-law who's Mexican. But he was like, I only like white girls. <laughs> and so they're like, fine, you can have the white girl. Who's going to marry the Mexican? Who's going to marry the Asian girl? We need a big black woman. Who's going to marry the big black woman? Because we need some soul food. Like, and so my kids had this full, like, I know I'm not supposed to say any of this stuff anymore. I'm going to get canceled. But whatever. <laughs> Um, but my kids, they had this whole like, and they were like, and then what we'll do is at night, we'll just, whoever's cooking that day, we'll turn their lamp, their porch light on. And then we'll all know just to go to that house, eat dinner, and then we can go back to our own houses for, for whatever. So, um, so yeah, the details of communalism can get a little weird, you know, when you try to work them out, but, but my boys had it all figured out how you can live like the early church. Um, you know, you just got to make sure you marry the right people. Uh, so anyway. I don't know why I told that story, but we're, we're going to dive back into the kingdom today. Um, I kind of wrapped up last week my original outline for this series um, that was designed to kind of carry us to Pentecost, which was last week. Um, but I do have to say a, a bit ironically, since I had to open up with an apology for going long last week, um, that this week's message is actually building off of last week's message. So basically, though I went way too long last week, I still wasn't really able to finish everything I felt like God wanted to say to us. So this is like part two of the uber long, crazy message. Um, And so uh, if you didn't catch last week's, you probably want to go back and listen to it because this week's going to build on that. But last week we talked about uh, the culture of the church, especially the atmosphere and paradigm shift we have um, when we realize that God has a plan that God is in control and has a plan for our life. We discussed how much different it is to believe that God has a plan that he invites us into and and how different that is from the idea of us having a plan that we invite God into. Uh, It's way different for God to have a plan that we join than for us to have a plan that we expect God to join. Uh, So we serve a sovereign God who has a plan for your life and for my life, um, and that plan is to serve God's greater plan for the world and for his kingdom. Um, Ephesians 2.10 says this, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good the good things he planned for us long ago. That word so, epi in the Greek, is, is incredibly important. It basically means you weren't saved by Jesus just so you could go to heaven. Heaven is an amazing perk. It's a, it's a wonderful thing um, that that gets tacked on, but that's not why you were saved. You were saved so you could fulfill the plan God has for you, the things that he laid out for you. There's a purpose for you. Um, and our job as new creations is to join and serve God's plan, not just make our own plan and hopefully invite him into them. But this passage invites attention. Um, that we, uh, attention, Lena, um, that we really need to uh, draw out this morning. Uh, and that's this interesting nature of a verse that 
both indicates this kind of predetermined plan that was made for us long ago, long before we were born, while also inferring that we uh, can choose to do the good things that God laid out for us or kind of choose not to do them. It, it creates this tension uh, that we live in. And, uh, and this invites us into this idea of stewardship, which is one of the strongest themes in all the Bible. We talked last week about one of God's earliest plans. Uh, Genesis 1 explains how God made this plan for humanity uh, before he created us. Um, as, we, uh, as far as we can tell, this is kind of unique in the creation. Everything else he just spoke and it happened. Let there be light and there was light. Let there be land coming out of the water. There's land coming out of the water. Just God spoke and it happened. But with humans, it's different. He says, then God said, let us make human beings in our own image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals of the earth, and the small animals that scurry on the ground. And then after deliberating, just kind of making a plan, thinking through it a little bit, God did what he planned, and humanity was created with this purpose of ruling over the creation that, uh, in God's stead. We talked about how Adam and Eve kind of boogered up that plan, uh, but how our Bible's in, the very last chapter of the Bible, ends with the fulfillment of this original plan, where God is kind of back to that exact same uh, vision that he started with. If you missed last week's message, I recommend going back and listening because it's pretty formative to how we do things um, around here. But you may want to take a couple sessions because like I said, it's long. Um, but right here in this early plan of God, humans are brought uh, into stewardship, this idea of stewardship. It's hard to get much more fundamental to the story than the idea that we are created for stewardship. Um, this is absolutely foundational to kingdom living. Right here in Genesis, in the very first plan for humanity's creation is the idea that humans will rule or govern or have dominion over whatever your version of the Bible uh, calls it. But basically the idea that humans were made to have stewardship over God's creation. In other words, we would rule and reign uh, in place of the one who is truly worthy to rule and reign. This is before there was sin, before there was anything. This was the plan for what it meant to be human. And this concept carries all through the scripture. One, once the Israelites are in the promised land, uh, a transition we're actually going to talk about this morning, the management of the land was built on this idea of stewardship. Um, nobody, no, It was going to be divvied up by tribes and families and, and people, but nobody ever really owned the land. It was actually one of the principles of living in the promised land. Um, they had things like family redeemers, where if you made a mistake and lost your property, somebody in your family, no matter what happened, could always buy it back. Um, they also had things like Jubilee, where um, every, uh, every seventh Sabbath, every Sabbath of a Sabbath, so you would have a seven-year period, then there'd be a rest for a land, another seven-year period, rest for a land. Every, after seven of those, so after a Sabbath of Sabbaths, or every 50 years, the year after the seventh Sabbath, um, they had what they called a jubilee, where everything went back to the original family, the original family lands. That way, if you, you know, made some mistakes and made some bad, you know, investments, things, and you lost everything, your kids weren't, therefore, doomed to also be poor. They got a chance, they got a piece of land and a chance to make something of themselves. There was like a do-over. Um, and all these rules sound great if you're the family that kind of lost everything. Like if you're the family that, you know, that needed a do-over, these things sounded awesome. But it always seemed a little bit unfair for the people who did well, you know. And there was some protections for them. You actually didn't buy a land based on its, like, true value. You bought a certain number of harvests. And so if you were only, like, three years from a jubilee, and so you know, I'm not going to buy that piece of land. i got to give it back in three years. You only paid for three years' worth of the land. And so there were some protections to where when, you know, you weren't just getting gypped and you were going to work hard, build your empire, and then lose it all every 50 years. They, they built some things in. But God's reasoning for setting all this up was based on, on verses like this. This is God speaking. The land must never be sold on a permanent basis, for the land belongs to me. You are only foreigners and tenant farmers working for me. This is God speaking to his people. So even though they, they were given land, he was like, but it's not your land. Don't think for a second. That, although there was personal ownership, you can't have a verse like thou shalt not steal if there's not the idea of personal ownership, that what's yours is yours and I can't take it. There was this idea of personal ownership, but at the same time, there was this idea that you don't actually own anything. I, God owns it and you just steward it or manage it. 
Um, and Jesus, maybe more than anybody else in Scripture, uh, built on this reality. A huge number of his parables um, start something like this. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. In this particular one, he gives three different um, uh, three different uh, uh, stewards three different amounts of money, and we, we all know the parable of the talents pretty well. But a lot of his parables started this way, with some um, king or ruler or head of house leaving and leaving his, his kingdom or his house or his land or whatever in charge of someone else. A lot of Jesus' parables that start with the kingdom of heaven is like are stewardship parables. They're ideas of somebody managing something on behalf of the one who really owns it. And then last week we talked about Revelation 22. Clearly promises a day where God's original plan for human stewardship over his creation would finally come into fruition. I break that down last week if you want to hear about it. So literally cover to cover and everywhere in between um, is, is full of this idea that God owns everything that is, um, but fully expects us to steward and manage it on his behalf. Uh, and the early church picked up on this. One of the passages outlining kind of the earliest church culture, um, much like we read last week, um, you can see stewardship shining through the early church. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. Um, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's blessing was upon them all. There was no needy among them because those who owned land and house would sell them and bring the money to the apostles and give uh, to those in need. And all the believers were united heart and mind. They felt like what they owned was not their own. Everybody starting to get that itchy feeling like this is going to be a, a, a money message, like an offering message? Does somebody want to pass the plate? No. <laughs> Kidding. Um, so they owned it. But they also didn't own it. They merely managed it. They got this sense that what they had wasn't really theirs. They were just managing it. So one of the most rudimentary concepts in all the scripture is this idea of stewardship. Um, it's there before there was sin in the original plan of God that I'm going to make humans to be stewards. Um, it was there in the Torah and God's law. It was part of almost all of Jesus' teaching. And one of the first elements the early church picked up on is this part that humanity, um, and in the very end, that humanity, once Jesus returns, will return to that idea of stewardship. You cannot get more fundamental in the scripture than this idea that we don't actually own anything. It's all God's, and we just manage it. It's part of what it means to be human. And it's definitely part of what it means to live in the kingdom of God. But what I'd love to draw out this morning is a little more nuanced. Um, it's part of our stewardship that I think we sometimes uh, miss um, and it, we're going to meet Joshua uh, in it uh, right when he was bringing uh, this kind of transitional kingdom moment when he was bringing the, the kingdom of God into the promised land. It's this kind of transition point um, that Joshua makes uh, where you can really see this come through. Moses had led the people out of Egypt. Um, they had received the Torah at Mount Sinai on Pentecost. They marched right up to the promised land, sent some spies in the land to check it out. We actually talked about this in this series they came back with a bad report, um, and it scared everybody, and so they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years um, until that generation was gone, and this next generation led by Joshua uh, was finally ready to enter into the promised land. Joshua gets instructions from God on how to do it, how to enter the land just right, um, and the Levites, who are basically the worship leaders, are supposed to take the Ark of the Covenant, put it on their shoulders with these long poles, and just walk into the river. They're supposed to just walk right into the, to the Jordan River. Um, and this ark represented the presence of God, the, the promise of God, the covenant of God was held inside of it. And, uh, and, and the river was supposed to part the same way the Red Sea did. Um, but I love what actually happens in the story because when Moses did it, he just stuck his staff in the water and the water parted. And so by the time the people get involved, there's already a dry path and all they have to do is walk in it. It happens a little differently with Joshua. The priests will carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. As soon as their feet touch the water, the water will flow, or the, the, the flow of the water will be cut off upstream, and the river will stand up like a wall. And so, uh, can anybody sense what that would feel like? You know, that first step, you know, you've got these, these guys, and it, it says that it was during the harvest season when the r river had overflowed its banks, 
So the river's flowing hard. They've got uh, a box on their shoulders anywhere from three to 600 pounds. They've got these poles and they have to actually step into the water, you know, that has to feel a little bit spooky and take some faith. Um, and, and trusting that the second the foot hits the water, it's going to start to pack up on the, on the upstream side and they're going to make it through. Which means sometimes we have to step into our miracle before it happens, which is something to think of. Sometimes God will send us the right people that we've been praying for, but he wants us to go up and introduce ourselves and give them a call. Sometimes God will provide the job we've been praying for, but we still have to apply, right? God will give us the, the, the children we've been asking for, but we have to... No, we better stay away from that one. Um, sometimes God will speak to your kids. I didn't even write that. It popped in my head as I was talking. Sometimes, sometimes God will speak to your kids exactly the way you've been praying He will, but you've got to tell Him what His voice sounds like. In other words, sometimes even when it comes to miracles, we're called to be stewards. We have to manage the miracle. In fact, the gist of what we're going to be talking about this morning is what it means to manage our miracle that God has done for us. And after Joshua and the Israelites cross over the Jordan River, the Jordan River stops up, they walk across on dry ground. This is when Joshua's job really starts because he was told exactly how to manage this miracle. This is when all the people have crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, now choose 12 men, one from each tribe. Tell them, take 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan, carry them out, and pile them up at the place you will camp tonight. So Joshua called together 12 men he had chosen, one from each tribe of Israel. He told them, go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up a stone and carry it out on your shoulders. 12 stones in all. And for each, for each of the 12 tribes of Israel, you will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? And then you can tell them. They remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the ark of the Lord's covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial to the people of Israel forever. This is our root texture, our text for this morning. So this is the word of the Lord. And I actually love this passage. uh, And it's one we hear quite a bit. We hear people talk about this idea of building an altar, of building a memorial, building a reminder. Um, These happen over and over again in the Old Testament narrative where God um, would do something amazing and then he would tell the people to build something out of the ordinary, something that nature wouldn't build. Do it in a way that it pops out a little bit so that when people see it, they're going to go, what is, what's the story here? Twelve rocks stacked on top of each other. That doesn't just happen. And then it prompts you uh, to tell the story, um, something that, that might jump out at us a bit. Um, and so in this story, they put 12 stones from inside the river and they stack them up on top of each other. And the stacked stones are supposed to serve as a reminder to tell the story. Uh, uh, and, and, and this is what I want to draw out of this this morning, because generally when we hear this message, the message stresses the building of the altar. Build altars in your life. Build things to remind you. Build, you know, put things up that will remind you of what God has done to, to motivate. And so the, the focus seems to be the motivation of building the altar. But what I want to look at this morning is that's only half the command. That's not the whole thing. We will use these stones to build a memorial. And in the future, the children will ask you what these stones mean. Then you can tell them what it means. There's actually two things we're supposed to do in this command. One is to build the altar. And two is to tell the story. And tell the story. And Israel only did one of these. So then the men uh, did as Joshua had commanded. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River Uh, one for each tribe, just as the Lord had told Joshua. They carried them to the place where they camped for the night and constructed the memorial there. So this is why I get nervous about sermons that stress the need to build altars and memorials to remind you of the things God has done because it is completely possible to build an altar and still never complete the second part of this command. Because Joshua followed the first part to the letter. He sent 12 men to get stones. They stacked them up just like they were told to. The construction went perfectly, but they never told the story. You want me to prove that to you? You want to know how I know that? This is how I know that they never completed the the second half of that. That that even though they went across, they built the altar, they never told the story. Because at the end of Joshua's life, 
the very beginning of the book of Judges, when Joshua is dying, we read this. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him with the, uh, within the border of the inheritance at Tim, uh, I'm not even going to try, in the mountains of Ephraim, the north side of Mount Gash. And when all the generations had gathered to their, to their, that generation had gathered to their fathers, another generation rose who did not know the Lord nor the work he had done for Israel. This is not that long after Joshua built that memorial. This is not that long after Joshua stacked up all 12 of those stones and you have a generation, the very next generation did not know God nor his works. Which means Joshua built the altar, but he quit telling the story. Because the very next generation did not know the story. Building an altar is not enough. Joshua built an altar, and that was not enough. In the 2000 Summer Olympics, which I know you guys remember like it was yesterday, um, the United States women's 4x100 relay team. You guys remember those guys? No. <laughs> they were the fastest team in the world. The four fastest women in the world, all on the same relay team. There was literally no team on the planet that could match them for speed, talent, and ability. It was the fastest 4x100 relay team there had ever been and probably ever will be. Everyone, literally everyone knew they were going to win. There was no doubt that the, it, was, it was literally a competition to see who was going to take second because the women's 4x100 um, was going to be won by the U.S. No questions asked, except they took bronze. The Bahamas and Jamaica both beat the U.S. team. Um, and losing to those two teams had nothing to do with speed, talent, and ability. No one, even the teams that won when questioned, you know, did not hesitate to believe that the U.S. team had more speed, talent, and ability. Like, everybody knew that. Even the Bahamas and the Jamaican teams both recognized that. And when, when analysts go back and look, the reason the U.S. team lost, sloppy exchanges. Everything happens in this little less than two second part of the race where the baton is handed from one runner to the next. And everybody, they, the, most people believe, the analysts believe that they got arrogant and sloppy with their handoffs. They were so fast, they didn't think about how important it is to have a clean handoff. You guys realize that the, the kingdom of God is a relay? It's always been a relay which depends on a clean handoff that takes place within what relay runners call the exchange zone. And if we miss that exchange zone, we risk losing the race. Anyone know the very first time the Bible refers to itself? The very first time the Bible ever talks about the Bible. It's kind of a fascinating little passage. It kind of sneaks by you. You don't even realize where it is. But uh, but Moses, the Israelites have been set free, and, the, and they get in this battle with Amalek, one of the other uh, nations just outside of, of Egypt. And it's this kind of cool story we talk about sometimes where Moses would hold up his staff, and anytime he holds up his staff, the Israelites would win. And when his arms would get tired, he put the staff down, they would start to lose. And so he's got these two buddies that come and hold his arms up so the Israelites can win. It's kind of a neat story. Um, but right after that, when that story is over, Israelite wins the battle, um, it says this. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua. Then, then I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, the Lord is my banner. This is the very first time that, the, that we hear God telling somebody, you should probably write this down. And it's kind of surreal and trippy to think that the only reason we know that story is because Moses obeyed that exact line. God said, you should write this down. Moses did, and we read it. Like how bizarre and like cosmic is that, you know? And it's the first time we read that, 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 that the, the God mentions the writing down of these stories. Like, hey, these things are important, and people are going to need them, so go write this down. Tell the story. And that's basically what the Bible is. I mean, it's basically most of its narrative, and it's God doing some things among his people, and those people writing it down. And I don't want to, like the, the weird 
surreal blend of human creativity and God's divine uh, inspiration is kind of bigger than I can fully understand in the creation of scripture. So I don't pretend to understand all that. But from the human perspective, it's God doing things and people going, I should write this down. I need to tell this story. This is important. People need to know this happened. And that's how we get our scripture. So the kingdom of God has always been this divine relay, this handing off of the story. And we know that this continues, uh, maybe even intensifies in the New Testament. Look at what Jesus says just before he ascends to his father. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore your kingdom? He replied, the father alone has the authority to set these dates and times. They are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I love the shift of responsibility that happens in this passage, because it starts with them going, um, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore your kingdom? And the disciples are like totally in spectator mode at this point. They're like, hey, when are you going to do something? And Jesus kind of flips it on him, doesn't he? He says, aha, and you will be my witnesses everywhere. So (laughs) did you catch the flip? They're like, Jesus, when are you going to do something? He's like, good question. When are you going to do something? Like, and the, and the responsibility in that verse all of a sudden shifts from God doing something to God going, and now it's your job to take the baton and do something. Go. There's a, that's an exchange zone right there. And this is when the whole thing starts to come together because This idea of stewardship, of us managing what is ultimately God's, is old. Actually, older than humanity itself. It's in that original plan of God. Let's make people to be stewards. Wired into us as image bearers is this mechanism of management whereby we steward what is entrusted to us. That reality stays through the entire scripture. And that stewardship has always been twofold. As old as the wilderness, God is telling his people that the land wasn't theirs. They had to steward the stuff. The land's not yours. You have to steward it. It was his. Likewise, the early church immediately recognized with their wealth and possessions that it wasn't really theirs. It was God's, and they were just stewards. They have to steward their stuff. But that's only half the stewardship story. Because Moses, after his battle with Amalek, When he was told to write this down, Joshua, when he stacked up the rocks, he was told to tell the story. And the disciples, when they they were standing with Jesus, his final words to them were the same thing. You have to also steward the story. Yes, we steward the stuff. We steward the things that were given to us, but we're asked to steward more than that. We're asked to steward the story. Most of us have received the good news. If you haven't, Here it is. God created humans and a good earth and we broke it. And we're all born with this desire to do what's wrong. It's deep in us. And we confirm that by doing what's wrong. We're we're broken. We sin. And God, to deal with that sin, had to send his son to live the life we couldn't live and die the death we should have died and take our place and raise again to give us life. And when we put our faith in that, it's, it's the gospel. It's the good news. When we choose to believe that, we are saved. And then we are asked to steward that story. We are given a miracle. We are given life that we didn't earn. If we believe that, the Bible says we are his. We are in his kingdom. And that's only half the story. The other half is that we now have to steward that story. We have to manage that miracle. I'm sure all of you know I have 16 kids. If you don't know that, now is the time you freak out. And I feel in my heart that every single one of them is a blessing straight from God. Every one of them is a miracle. I love babies. I think babies are miracles. The Richillas just had a little baby girl. She's a miracle. Amanda just had a little baby boy. He's a miracle. Their second little baby boy. Total miracle. Jess is due, you know, in about a month with their fourth beautiful little miracle. Not to mention, like, the whole crop we had last summer. There's got to be something in the water around here. It's, 
Actually, Lori, I love it. Lori, they weren't expecting their new one, kind of a surprise baby, and they had trouble um, having uh, Colton, and so they really thought that door was closed. And so it kind of snuck up on her, and when she took the test, she called Eric in, and she was kind of crying, and it, like happy tears, and, you know, and she said, I think it's because I hugged Esther last week. <laughs> so, so, yeah, if, if ever... I told her we're going to start renting her out, you know, <laughs> put fertility doctors out of business. <laughs> but, but every single baby, no matter how much fun they are to make, there's that joke again, they're a miracle from God. But how many of you know that that miracle does not manage itself? Amen? That miracle does not change its own diapers. That beautiful little miracle doesn't come ready to feed itself. That miracle does not walk itself around the house when it's having trouble falling asleep. It doesn't potty train itself. That miracle doesn't teach itself to drive, I'm afraid. That's why this is all turning gray. They don't change their own brakes. My daughter's brakes went out this week and some brake shop was going to rip her off and so I'm doing an emergency brake job because she's my miracle. And you have to manage... Your miracle. I don't think it makes it any less of a miracle that they take some management. I think God has always done this. And the gospel is no different of a miracle. God saving us is an act of sheer grace. We do nothing to deserve it. And I don't even believe we can really do much to apply it. But that miracle is then handed to us. Are you going to manage it? What are you going to do with this miracle? Steward the story. Share it. Take it to others. Tell the story. Hand off the baton. Joshua could have never in a million years made that water part by himself. Never. He couldn't have done that in his own strength ever. All he did was obey and send the right guys into the water and watch as God did everything. God answered everything. It was a bold-faced miracle, no question. But that's when Joshua's job was supposed to start. Joshua needed to manage the miracle. Joshua was supposed to build an altar and tell the story, but the next generation didn't know the story. He built the altar, but that wasn't enough. Joshua fumbled the handoff. And I feel like the church has done the same thing in a lot of ways today. We build these buildings, these beautiful spaces, these places that sit in our towns like a pile of stone, and we just assume that those altars will do all the work. And obviously, I'm not against church. I'm not against the space we meet in, but that's only half the job. The other half is to tell the story, pass the baton, manage the miracle. And this is there's this epic scene in the book of Revelation that captures both sides of this. It's wrapped in symbolism, so I don't even pretend to fully understand what's happening, but Satan's involved. He's named by name. And he and his minions are kind of thrown to earth and, and go after the church. And John records this. And they, they, the church, have defeated him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So according to John, the church wins, won, will win. I don't know what tense you're supposed to use when you're talking about prophecy. But they do it. They have victory two ways. By the blood of the Lamb, that's the miracle part. That's the grace part. That's the part you can't really do anything with. That's just given to you as a free gift. That's the part that saves you. But the other half of the story is they defeat him by the word of their testimony. By stewarding the story. By telling their story. Something interesting about this word testimony. The Greek word is uh, uh, marturia. Marturia. It's a derivative of another word we've read, word we've read this morning, which is uh, martos. Martos. We read it in Acts 1. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my martos, telling people about me everywhere, my witnesses. How many of you would have joined if you knew that the invitation was to be a martyr? Hey, you will be my martyr. <laughs> awesome. That sounds like fun. <laughs> Sign me up. There's some water. How do I get baptized? We get our word martyr from this. You will be my witness. Paul said we will like offer your lives a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. 
Martyr yourself, in other words. But that word means be a witness. Give your testimony. Tell people the story. Once you receive the Holy Spirit, you will be my testimony, my record, my witness of what I've done. John says when, when, when the enemy attacks the church, the church wins by being witnesses, by being a, a record, a testimony. We receive the miracle, and then we manage the miracle. So how do we respond to this? I generally open up my messages with like some personal story from my own life, and I do this for a couple of reasons. One, because it's fun and it loosens people up and gets everybody laughing a little bit. But also because I think storytelling is a crucial part of the kingdom of God. It's actually commanded that we do this. And I personally think it's supposed to be the root of what it means to share our faith. Over the past several decades, we've, we've kind of defined evangelism by spreading the gospel, which to us generally means trying to convince people of the essential doctrines of the Christian faith, right? That's what we call evangelism. We try to convince people of the essential doctrines of the faith or by trying to get people on board with a Christian worldview or trying to get people to live godly lives. But going all the way back to Joshua, the command seems to be that we tell people what God is doing in our life, what God has done. And for Joshua, that means God parted a river. It was a miracle. You should have seen it. If we combine that with this verse in Revelation where we learn that we overcome not just by the blood of the Lamb, but by the word of our own testimony, then it seems like the job is clear. We tell the story of what God has done in our life, which means a couple things. First, we have to know what God is doing in our lives. Right? It's a little hard to tell people what God is doing in our lives if we don't know what God is doing in our lives. If you feel like God isn't doing anything in your life and you have nothing to share because it doesn't seem like God is doing anything, then you got to start there. Don't resort to empty doctrinal statements about who Jesus is historically. You need to go back and listen to a couple messages from this, from this series because we talk about that. You need to find out what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. And second, you need to listen to last week's message because you have to start living with a new paradigm. Waking up in the morning going, God has a plan for this day. I want to be a part of it. I want to know what God is doing. We have to live under that new paradigm shift of knowing that God is in control and has a plan. In other words, if you don't feel like God is doing anything that you have to share right now, then you have to start there. Lean in and say, God, what are you doing in my life? What's happening? What's going on? How do I join your plan right now? And start asking the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what is, what is happening. What do you have to share? Because the second thing we have to do if we want to steward this story well is tell our story in a natural and, and, and common way. It should be as, as relational as breathing. We do this all the time with, with people. We tell them what we do for a living, how many kids we have, what's going on in our world. We tell our story. Where we grew up, we, we, we tell our own story completely naturally. And if we're in touch with what God is doing in our life, it should be part of our story. It should be just as natural to say, this is, what, this is what's going on in my world. This is what God's done for me. And that takes relationships. See, it doesn't take any relationship to try and convince somebody of a doctrinal truth. I've known guys like that. They never walk into a situation without going, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior? <laughs> like it just, you don't have to know anybody to ask those questions. But it's different when somebody in your work is hurting and you're like, man, I've been through similar stuff. I never would have made it without my church family and Jesus. If that's what God has done in your life, that's what you tell Man, I, I barely hung on with it. If I didn't have Jesus, I don't think I'd have made it. And that becomes your testimony. <laughs> we, were, we were doing a job one time and a buddy with me that I was kind of working with and, and discipling and we prayed that morning, God, give us a chance to talk to somebody about Jesus today. And we, we went in and, and we were supposed to wait for the property managers to come and move all the appliances and, and he wasn't there and we didn't want to wait and so we pulled it all and he showed up a few minutes later and, and it was like, I'm so sorry I was late. And I was like, nah, don't worry about it. We're not going to charge you for it. We just wanted to get started. And he was like, man, you guys are awesome. Like most of, the, most of you carpet layers are jerks. Like 
what's different about you guys? I was actually in the other room and I heard him ask the question and I was like, yes. And so like, I'm listening and my buddy was like, I don't know, we just want to be nice guys. You know, I was like, dude, that's exactly what we prayed for like an hour ago. That was the slow pitch. That's the one hit out of the park. Here's what's different. We happen to love Jesus. Anyway, I don't know why I told that. That wasn't in my notes. But the ability to, I was, I was listening to a guy this week who's one of John Maxwell's like closest uh, advisors and buddies. He's actually converting John Max, all of John Maxwell's material into Spanish. He's a, he's a pastor in Latin America. And, and he, he did an interview of John Maxwell like 20 years ago where he asked him some questions about if you were to go back to pastoring, what would your church look like? What would you stress? And then kind of in a fun way, he, he gave him that exact same interview a couple weeks ago. So 20 years between the two interviews. He said John Maxwell's questions were almost exactly the same, except John Maxwell said uh, that he would stress teaching people to share their faith just in their regular lives. He said because John Maxwell said that he believes the, the days of just inviting people to church so that they could get saved are almost gone. And he was like, so if I were to do a church today, I would teach people to talk about Jesus out in the world. Which is ironic because I already had this message outlined and almost done when I heard that guy speak. And it, I had already decided this is what we were going to talk about. And I don't know that I fully agree with John Maxwell, but I will say this. The, the building of the altar is not enough. Building the church, having the church is not enough. We're also supposed to tell the story. We're supposed to tell our kids the story. We're supposed to tell our coworkers and our family and our neighbors and those around us the story. It doesn't mean being weird. Do you know Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior? That's not what I'm talking about. It means sharing your story. What has God done in your life? Man, I'd never make it without my church family. It's totally okay to say that. I've never made it through without Jesus. So the way I'd love to respond to this message is do a couple things. First, tune into what God is doing in your life. If you have no idea, then that's where you got to start. Lean into that. God, what mission are we on together? What are we supposed to be doing? What are you, what's happening here? Because I don't think Jesus came and lived a life we should have lived, died the death we should have died, and rose again just so that we could live and die and never know why. I don't think he did that just so you can plug through another work day, come home and watch the news. I think there's more, and we have to start there. But second, once you realize that you're part of this story of God, tell that story. Ladies, tell your story girls what's going on in your world. Tell, tell your friends what's going on in your world. Have the courage to ask somebody, what's God doing in your life? What's going on with you? How's God moving in you right now? Joshua fumbled the handoff when it comes to telling the story to the next generation, and he built the altar, but he didn't tell the story. And we can't afford to make that mistake.